Doug has closed the door, which means we are officially good to go. Uh, welcome to the open, open meeting of the Digital Scholarship Subcommittee of the Provost's Task Force on the Future of UT Libraries. That's quite a mouthful. Um, thank you to everyone who is joining us on this first day of summer, which happens so closely after the first day of spring. Uh, there are a bunch of people joining us online uh, for the live streaming, so hello to everyone. And uh, let's get started. Um, for those who are uh, joining the conversation now, I'm going to provide a quick overview of what we are trying to accomplish this year. Uh, then I'll introduce the panelists, uh, who each have about five to seven minutes to make uh, quick pitches for what they're doing and how uh, their work can inform our efforts. And then we'll open it up to uh, audience conversation, and we want to make sure that we have a lot of time for that. So I'll try to be brief, and if you find me slowing down, do that. Uh, so, uh, Provost McInnes uh, called for this task force early in the fall, and we have started meeting since fall. Um, what we are trying to do here uh, is have a structure that is representative of the campus community. So, the task force has two co-chairs, uh, Michelle Addington, who is the Dean of Architecture, and uh, Lorraine Harricombe, uh, the Director of Libraries and Vice Provost. There are three faculty representatives, uh, and the five of us form the steering committee. Each of the faculty representatives is also chairing a subcommittee. So uh, Jennifer Ebler from Classics is chairing the collection subcommittee. Uh, Klaus Wilkie from Integrative Biology is chairing Spaces. And I, Unmil Karadkar, am chairing the Digital Scholarship Subcommittee. Um, we recognize that there is some overlap in these subcommittees, right? These are not completely uh, disassociated from each other. So we expect to see some overlap. But at the same time, we don't want them all to do the same thing. <coughs> uh, in terms of the timeline, uh, our efforts began in the fall, and by June, uh, we have to submit a uh, completed report to the provost's office. Uh, the individual subcommittees will put together their, their reports in mid-May to early June, and then during June, uh, we will put together all the reports together into a final report. So all of our data collection activities, all of our input from campus community activities, uh, will happen in the next uh, month or two, or will end in the next month or two, I should say. The context for this um, task force is that the academic landscape around libraries is changing. There are different types of resources that libraries are expected to support. Uh, there is a proliferation of uh, analog physical resources. There is a proliferation of digital resources. There is expectation now that people who are doing research with other kinds of materials than the central libraries have typically supported, uh, for example, physical samples, also be supported in some sense. Right? So, so there, is a in, there is an increasing demand for what needs to be supported. At the same time, there are constraints on growth. Our campus only has so much space. The libraries only have so much money. So, so there are financial constraints, there are space constraints, uh, there are uh, constraints in terms of what we can buy, there are constraints in terms of uh, picking priorities. And so the question is, how do we balance our uh, needs with the resources that we have? What's also going on beyond just this campus is the um, environment in the academy is changing. Uh, the policies in higher education are changing. Uh, the expectations with respect to open source scholarship are changing. Um, funding structures are changing. The types of programs that we offer on this campus and on other campuses are changing. So as the needs of the campus change, we need to figure out how our services and our libraries can keep up with 
maintaining a research one premier status that we have had for the last, I, I don't even know how many years, right? But we have become used to that status and we want to keep that status going ahead. And the question is, how do we do it in the face of these challenges? And in addition to all of these things, there are emerging technologies uh, that we haven't traditionally had to grapple with. So user interfaces, uh, visualization software, analysis software, uh, and expectations of uh, students in terms of how spaces are used, what kind of support they need, are all changing. So with this background, uh, the charge for the task force is to develop a shared vision for how UT libraries will support UT's mission, right? And that includes uh, teaching, research, service, uh, uh, public outreach, all of, all of the above. The second charge is given that vision, what are the resources that we will need to accomplish this vision? And we don't want to reach for pie in the sky expectations, but we want to scale it to the resources that are available, that are realistically manageable. And then the next step in that process is to figure out how do we go about getting those resources or making those resources uh, usable on the campus. So a strategy for getting to, to that vision using the resources that have been identified. <coughs> Um, in order to accomplish this charge, uh, we are adhering to a set of principles. And the first principle is that no one here wants to change the existing mission of the libraries, okay? That has never been a part of the conversation. That was raised once, and the message from the provost was clear, that what we are asking you is not, repeat, not to change the mission of the libraries, but simply to find ways to support this mission in the best way possible. So please, please remember that as we go through this conversation, is this we are not fundamentally out to change the mission of the libraries. Um, the second part here is that we recognize that UT libraries have played a critical role in the intellectual climate on this campus. And we want that role to continue. So we are not looking to create new structures that will change the role of the libraries. That is also not a part here. And the last thing that I want to stress in terms of principles is the word shared. We want to get input from the campus community. And this needs to be our vision, the vision of all of you people in this room, the vision of all of the people out there who couldn't make it into this room, and the people who are joining us remotely. Okay. So we, we really want to have input from a variety of stakeholders in this process. <clears throat> um, with that notion of input, we have tried to make sure to get your input in, in different ways. So not only are we doing uh, events like these, but there is a website where you can provide feedback to us. Uh, it's really easy to reach us from the provost website find the uh, tasks, uh, task force uh, segment, click on our task force, and that takes you uh, to a feedback section on the task force webpage, okay? Uh, so far, we have had over 130 responses as of last week, and more are coming in every day. Uh, Doug here and his team are reading these diligently and passing them on to the respective uh, subcommittees as they come in. So, so these are not just vanishing into a black hole somewhere. Um, there is a Twitter account. So feel free to tweet at this account, or you can tweet at me. Um, in terms of public events, uh, the, our first public event was a, task, uh, was a town hall uh, that was held in November. If you were there, you know how awesome it was. If you were not there, Fear not, there is going to be one more on April 29th. All right, so you can join us for the next one. Um, there has been a uh, meeting of the collection subcommittee, just like this, uh, back in February, and there is going to be a meeting of the spaces subcommittee in April. Uh, do join us for those, and then there is the, uh, there is the meeting today. 
this is an introduction to uh, the people who are serving on the digital scholarship uh, subcommittee. And what you will see is that there is a representation from a wide variety of campus units. So there is uh, the School of Information, uh, there is uh, Engineering, Geosciences, Liberal Arts, uh, TAC. Given the diversity of our campus, it is simply not possible to have representation from every single department or college. But I think we have enough of a diversity here to uh, bring together uh, perspectives from uh, different segments of the campus. So, oh, one more thing. Now that you know who these people are, please reach out to them if you know any of them. So I've just given you a list of more targets to point at and say, hey, here is what I need to do. Uh, just like the task force has a charge, our subcommittee has a charge. And I'm going to read this off because uh, there's no point memorizing this. So our subcommittee is to assess the current and future needs for, digital, for supporting digital scholarship on this campus. And we are to do this being mindful of the variability of expectations and requirements in different disciplines. Okay. Uh, we need to identify and evaluate emerging best practices, opportunities, and challenges for research library support. And then we want to develop recommendations for sustainable strategies uh, for this engagement. Given the disciplinary variability, uh, we are striving really, really hard not to come up with a prescriptive definition for what digital scholarship is, okay? So we are careful to label this as a description of digital scholarship and not a definition. And the idea again is that digital scholarship, when you convert it into an adjective as a digital scholar, is not a binary thing. It's, it's not that you are either a digital scholar or you are not one. But there are certain activities that you may do digitally, and we want to be supportive of those activities rather than uh, either neglecting or actively excluding uh, certain constituents on this campus. Okay. So what we are looking at is support using digital techniques, digital methods, digital tools for research and teaching. So this is not just for research. And we are looking at interactions with electronic data in activities like conversion into electronic formats for formats that are analog or physical, um, how these formats, uh, how these objects are collected, selected, managed, preserved, uh, tools that enable such manipulations, analysis and visualization, and then the dissemination of data or of the publications related to these data. Um, thanks to Jennifer for providing at least the starting point for us. Uh, thanks to uh, Maria there for providing uh, significant input into this definition. And Rich, I don't think Rich is here today, but uh, th this is a uh, working definition or working description from, with input from a lot of different people. <clears throat> so one of the challenges that I think uh, I articulated with digital scholarship is that people don't always think they are digital scholars. They don't always go, I am a digital scholar, please, right? And that's a challenge. If we don't know that we are certain thing, how do we expect anyone to support it? How do we expect or how do we demand support for certain activities we don't even recognize we are doing? So here are the things that I think are fairly typically uh, uh, put into the bucket of digital scholarship, right? If you create data sets, publish data sets, if you use data sets, uh, if you create data visualizations, uh, if you do digital data analysis, if you download a bunch of data from the internet and you are uh, using SPSS, SAS, something to analyze it. Um, use of digital images, uh, audio, video, uh, documents, broadly speaking. Uh, or development of research support software, especially in uh, disciplines like physics, uh, more generally uh, integrative biology now. Uh, geosciences has a pretty strong tradition of uh, developing research support software. So these are all fairly um, unambiguously digital activities. On the other end of the spectrum, if all you are doing is using the digital tools 
to replace analog modalities. That is probably not digital scholarship. If all you are going to do is instead of writing with a pen on a piece of paper, use a word processor to write digital stuff and save it in a file, that is likely not digital scholarship, right? And again, there could be people who will argue that it is. And, and I would be hard pressed to argue against that. Uh, or if you're going to get PDFs and print them out and read them or read PDFs on a reader, but not do much else with it, that is probably not digital scholarship. And then there's a whole range of activities that we all participate in that we probably don't recognize as digital scholarship. So digitization of analog materials. There is a lot of science and research that goes into the best practices for creating such uh, digital surrogates. Um, study of these practices, these workflows, is absolutely digital scholarship. A management and organization of personal collections. So reading a PDF is probably not digital scholarship. But now if you are collecting a bunch of PDFs and now if you have 20,000 PDFs sitting on your computer and you need to figure out how to organize these and keep them available for your scholarship, there is a lot of information uh, that goes into figuring out how to make it tractable. That could be a form of digital scholarship. Uh, annotation and curation of documents. So you may be reading PDFs, but if you now start taking notes in your PDF documents, and these notes are now searchable, whereas your paper notes are probably not searchable, right? So you have tangibly changed the format of your uh, analysis of a document or studying of a document. That could be a form of digital scholarship. Uh, use of digital instruments. So people use more and more microscopes that put out digital data, telescopes. This is very well recognized. Lots and lots of astronomy data is being made available. But it's always not clear what is and what isn't digital scholarship in this sense. If, if you are taking care of a telescope, well, is that digital scholarship or not? If you are just getting data from the digital telescope, is that digital scholarship or not? Um, in uh, chemistry uh, or in other disciplines that have protocols, uh, making uh, your lab protocols digitally or uh, uh, using websites like protocols.io. Uh, there, there are a bunch of those that will help you uh, manage and publish your protocols. Um, again, that, that is a support activity for digital scholarship. <coughs> and finally, recording data about physical objects. So, you may not even know you are a digital scholar and I hope that after this meeting, after interacting with some of us, uh, may, maybe you will recognize a broader set of activities as being a part of digital scholarship. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hang, uh, hand over to uh, Jennifer Flaxpart, who is going to tell us about the activities that the libraries are already doing to support digital scholarship on this campus. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Flaxpart, the Assistant Director for Research Support and Digital Initiatives with the UT Libraries, and I'll use UTL as an abbreviation. Um, I'm also the UTL liaison to this subcommittee. And I've been asked to provide just a brief overview of selected ways that UTL supports and engages um, digital humanities and digital scholarship, just to set the stage for um, the panel discussion this afternoon. And I know you're anxious to hear from our panelists, but as I was putting together a list of ways over the years that we have evolved in supporting digital scholarship, I would be remiss in not highlighting some um, special areas including collections, the experts that we've brought to campus, our repositories, infrastructure and tools that we're building and introducing, skill and community building initiatives, and then our spaces and related services. So our initial forays in sharing collections online or digitally began over 25 years ago. Some of you may be familiar with the notable PCL online maps collection. Those are digitized maps that are no longer in um, under copyright. They're in the public domain. And another example that was early on is the Virtual Landscapes of Texas project, which scanned public domain documents 
providing access to early writings of interest to a broad range of individuals about um, what happened geologically in Texas. The Benson Latin American Collection, and I'll refer to it as Lilas Benson now, has been at the forefront of these endeavors. They've dedicated 25 plus years to digitizing and providing access to collections including, um, early on, LANIC, the Latin American Network Information Center and Primeros Libros Project. And over the past decade, they've become known for, nationally and internationally, developing and investing in post-custodial digitization, access to, and preservation of at-risk materials while allowing them to remain in the possession of their cultural parentage. So you may have heard of the Human Rights Digi Documentation Initiative, or HERDI, and the Latin American Digital Initiatives Repository, LADI, those are a part of that effort. And recently, Lilas Benson received Mellon Foundation funding for a related project to cultivate Latin American post-custodial praxis. I'm looking at Teresa Polk, my colleague from Lilas Benson, and she may well talk a little bit more about that. We've worked with Isla the Archive of the Indigenous Languages of Latin America. And we've led other projects, including extensive digitization of our Alexander Architectural Archives materials, posting of finding aids on TARO, which is the Texas Archival Resources Online entity, um, with descriptions and points uh, back to collections and where they reside, the South Asian Pulp Fiction Book Covers project, and the Prague Spring Archive Portal, which features some digitized documents from the LBJ Presidential Library here on campus. Experts, we have a long list of individuals that we have hired since 2015 in particular. And I'm actually going to associate some names with these titles as I read through them. They're approximately in the order that we have brought individuals with these titles and expertise to our organization. Um, and all of this has happened since 2015 and then 2016 um, when we were really reorganizing these individuals, some of them are new to these positions, but not new to the libraries. Some positions are new, and these individuals are new as a result of their hire. Some of these positions are grant-funded, and they've evolved together over time and continue to do so. But here's an example, or several. Our digital archivist position, Ashley Adair, who works with TAC as well. Our data management and research data services coordinator, Jessica Trelogan. Metadata librarians, Melanie Cofield and Itza Carbajal. A digital pedagogy librarian, now head of technology enhanced learning, Amber Welch. My own assistant director for research support and digital initiatives position, and that of my counterpart in Lila Spenson, um, Teresa Polk, head of digital initiatives there, a digital scholarship librarian, Alyssa Guzman, and her counterpart in Lilas Benson, a digital scholarship coordinator, Albert Palacios, a digital processing archivist, David Bliss, and a GIS and geospatial data coordinator, Michael Shinsky. We've hired Council on Library and Information Resources, or CLEAR, postdoctoral fellows, most recently in data curation around Latin American studies, Latin American and Latina and Latino studies, and energy economics. Our information literacy librarians work with faculty to incorporate digital approaches and technology in course assignments to enhance student learning. And last but certainly not least, and there are far too many experts here to name in this cohort, our subject librarian liaisons um, and related experts, some of those in titles I've just mentioned, provide research, life cycle, consultation support from the literature review and systematic review phase through um, Maybe methodological, digital method, uh, methodolo methodolo methodologies and tool recommendations to support those methodologies, data management plan development, public 
um, dissemination through publication, open access, and scholarly impact consultation, and long-term access and preservation so that these materials remain available. We have two repositories. We have Texas Scholar Works, our institutional repository, now over 10 years old, housing over 60,000 items spanning from theses and dissertations to conference reports, journals, newsletters, faculty publications, videos, and even student works. And in January of last year, 2018, we introduced the Texas Data Repository for publishing and archiving data sets and data-related products, which now includes over 200 data sets and almost 3,000 files that are publicly shared and data-related. And we subscribe and contribute to large-scale collaborative repositories um, so that we have access to materials we own and other institutions own digitally, like the Hathi Trust Digital Library, and we work with Google Books to share collection content where possible. We have been working hard to transform um, our IT entity to align with the Agile software development methodology, and since 2017, we've undertaken some impressive projects that are still ongoing. We're creating a DAMS, or a digital, access, uh, uh, digital asset management system, which is still in beta testing, and then launched a related project to create a front end so that users can access and download materials that are in the DAMS. A geospatial information systems, or GIS infrastructure, and a related project to develop front end access there through Geo Blacklight for discovery and access of published map services that are being overseen by our new GIS specialist. And we're using Omeka.net first as a foray to explore what um, a more comprehensive digital exhibition platform and enterprise system would look like so that we can showcase unique materials from throughout our vast collections. We skill and community build through different programs and conferences that we have hosted. In 2017, we hosted the HILT conference, Humanities Intensive Learning and Teaching, which launched a follow-up pop-up institute, DH at UT. And um, thereafter, we, um, in September, will build on that and host the Digital Frontiers 2019 conference. We have a lecture series, Digital Scholars in Practice, and we, um, or scholarship, rather, in practice, and that enables us to feature local as well as invited speakers to share their work and ways that they have explored things differently and pose questions that are new in their fields through digital scholarship. And we coordinate monthly DH and DS meetups so that we can connect the digital scholars here on campus with each other and with the experts that can support their work in the libraries and in other places across campus. We have some phenomenal spaces. If you've been in our learning commons, you know that we rolled that out in 2015. It has multiple learning labs that are media equipped that allow people to interact with and engage with things in digital form in new and different ways. Um, and they're an ideal location for some of the workshop series that we provide, including the Data and Donuts workshop series, as well as the Digital Humanities workshops at PCL series. Now, I'm always excited about what could be in the future. The Foundry is a good example of some of the things that are offered in conjunction with um, curricular um, support in the College of Fine Arts. And there you can find access to virtual reality and 3D printing and some of the other things that are on, on the edge, really, of what students do in their coursework for hands-on learning. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to say, I've been in this position now for two and a half years. And there are some takeaways that I just want to put out there before I hand the mic over to others. Scalability continues to be a challenge, not only for the consultation support and involvement with projects that we undertake, um, but as we want to be more 
visible on campus and engage with bridging barriers, grand research challenges, pop-up institutes, grants that are being written in conjunction with the libraries and outside of the libraries, that remains a challenge. Often there is one expert and many opportunities. Developer recruitment, retention, and the sheer number of IT positions that we have to engage with project work and then sustain that is a challenge, especially in Austin. More costs more. Think about server space and ongoing preservation and access. Change is constant. And I will echo Unmil's plea to encourage you to add your voice to what it is that you feel we should give priority to particularly across the categories that are the focus of the task force effort. The collections, digital scholarship, and library spaces, also related services. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, here's a quick introduction to our panelists. Uh, Theresa Paul is the head of digital initiatives at the Lilas Benson uh, Latin American Studies and Collections. Um, Chandra Butt is the Joe J. King Chair and Professor in the Department of Architectural and Environmental Engineering. Uh, Masha Prodanovic is, the associate, is an Associate Professor in the Department of Engineering. And she has created something called the Digital Rocks Portal in conjunction with uh, TAC. And finally, Eric Meyer uh, is the Dean of the School of Information, and he has research interests in digital scholarship as well, and an extensive uh, track record of, the, uh, of publication in this area. So uh, they will present in this order. So without further ado, uh, there is support. Hi, can you hear me all right? Good afternoon. Um, as Umil said, uh, my name is Teresa Polk. I'm the head of digital initiatives and post-custodial archivist at Leila Benson, Latin American Studies and Collections. Um, and as I was preparing for today and thinking about all the things I wanted to convey, I realized seven minutes is nowhere near enough time. So I am gonna try and focus on just one of our initiatives that is really personally close to, to my heart um, and hope that through it I can illuminate some of the aspirations and capabilities and challenges that we face across our, our area of work. Um, so, yeah, in 2005, um, set the stage a little bit, uh, an explosion took place in a former munitions depot in a civilian neighborhood in Guatemala City. Uh, when the uh, ombudsman for Human Rights uh, of Guatemala went in to check it out and make sure that the area was safe uh, for the community. What he found, surprisingly, were 80 million documents. 80 million documents from Guatemala's National Police, which had been disbanded in 1996 because of, uh, during the Guatemalan peace process because of their involvement in human rights, massive human rights violations throughout the, the course of the conflict. Generally, everyone had assumed, even knowing that the police had been involved in all of these violations over a long period of time, everyone assumed any documentation, any uh, documentary evidence of this was long gone, had been destroyed as, uh, during, during the negotiation of the peace process because, to prevent any kind of accountability. But lo and behold, here it was, 80 million documents. Um, I, I can't overstate um, what that find meant um, to Guatemalan civil society, to families of the disappeared, uh, to survivors of state violence, um, the, the sense of both hope and heartbreak, that they might finally know what happened, that these records could contribute to uh, ongoing legal processes, and to a sense of the country coming together to reckon with its past. Um, so that collection eventually became the historical archive of the Guatemala National Police, which we know colloquially, uh, commonly as HPN. 
a dedicated staff started processing and digitizing the collection almost immediately from the moment it was found to facilitate broad access and use to support these legal cases, for families to find out what had happened to their loved ones, um, and to support research. Um, however, in 2010, five years after the collection was found, a former general was elected as president of Guatemala. He had been deeply implicated in human rights violations during his time as a general, and there was real and reasonable fear what would be the fate of the AHPN when he took power. Um, there, you know, best case scenario, the archive might be closed, and worst case, the records could be destroyed completely. At that moment, they reached out to the University of Texas, and they asked us to maintain a secure duplicate copy of the digitized file the files as a dissuasive counterpart to prevent action being taken against the physical collection in Guatemala, and to create an online access point for the collection to enable broader research and engagement with it. We launched the digital archive of the HPN in December 2011, at, the, at that moment incorporating nearly 10 million, uh, 10 million digital records. In the first 70, 72 hours following the site launch, the archive received more than 10,000 page views, and as of last year, it received nearly one million. It remains widely used, widely accessed, um, and is a collection that continues to grow um, day by day. I was working in Guatemala in 2005 uh, when the collection was discovered. It is why I pursued a, pursued a, a career as an archivist. It's why I came to UT. Um, it is a tremendous privilege to be able to work with and support this material. Since its discovery, the documentation from the collection has been used in 14 separate legal cases pro prosecuting doc um, violations of human rights. Um, it has played a critical role in Guatemala's post-conflict reckoning with the past and has supported cutting-edge scholarship into the mechanisms of state repression. And we haven't even scratched the surface of what it's capable of and the information that it contains. Um, at the same time, the collection poses some really unique challenges and questions for us given its size, its complexity, 80 million documents, <laughs> um, and, and the content. I mean, this is really difficult content to work with. Um, those questions are both technical and they're also ethical at the same time. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm just gonna visit a couple, of the, a couple areas. Um, just kind of as um, a snapshot, though the questions we could ask of it, we could be here all day. <laughs> uh, on the more technical end, um, you know, re what resources does it require, both physical and digital, in order to safeguard this information and ensure its long-term preservation? The collection now, what we hold is 20 million files, about 10 terabytes of data. Um, with the resources and processing power we currently have, it has taken almost a complete calendar year to create a full preservation copy of that material. Um, and it continues to grow. And what it's gonna require, will, it will have greater and greater asks of us and our staff. Um, on the ethical side, um, you know, the, the documents in this collection document traumatic, traumatic, horrific events. Uh, how do we care for or reduce the potentially traumatic impacts for users of the collection, particularly survivors of state violence, families of the disappeared? Um, through a digital collection, we can't, we can't be there to provide care in the way we might want to be able to. And so we need to think through what are the ways to minimize um, the potentially negative impacts of the material. Privacy. Um, this collection contains a lot of very highly sensitive personal information, including medical information. On the one hand, that is an ethical question. It is a question of how do we select what should remain private, what should be hidden. But it's also a technical question. How do you systematically identify that material in 80 million documents? Um, and then you know, there's tremendous, tremendous research potential in this material. Um, recently, a, a scholar at the University of Michigan analyzed a statistically random sample of documents from the collection to identify a pattern in how the police documented or referred to, um, to death uh, in their collections in order to, to elucidate how they either 
made it invisible or made it more visible through the use of particular terminology and language. She did that work manually. If we could OCR this co tr uh, collection, transcribe it, and then use digital tools to do that kind of analysis, what kind of things could we learn um, through tools like natural language processing, topic modeling, and other digital tools? There's incredible potential uh, for what that, the ways that could serve and, and further research into the collection and into the historic moment that it documents. Um, at the same time, by treating these stories, these experiences, these traumatic events as raw data, as numbers and words, what do we lose by doing that? Do we further dehumanize the victims of that violence and lose their stories in those numbers? Um, so, you know, the AHPN is just one example of the type of work we do as a unit. The Leo Spencer Digital Initiatives team, many of who are here today, um, encompass a broad array of digital collections, collaborations, and scholarly projects, some dating back as early as 1992. Um, our work is guided by a shared commitment to nurturing reciprocal relationships with local campus and international partners, and a shared commitment to using digital technologies to facilitate preservation, access, teaching, and research with the materials held by Lila Benson and our partners. These initiatives highlight the heritage of Latin American, U.S. Latinx, African diasporic and indigenous American communities. Um, and to just quickly give you a sample of some of these initiatives, um, the Archive of Indigenous Languages of Latin America, which you heard mentioned earlier, ILA, seeks to preserve and provide access to data documenting indigenous languages of Latin America, including recordings, texts, and other multimedia materials representing nearly 400 different indigenous languages in 22 countries. Uh, ILA recently received an NEH grant to pilot a workflow for crowdsourced transcription of MISTEC language materials to improve overall collection access and facilitate research, um, facilitate reuse in linguistic research. Uh, Primeros Libros de las Américas was a collaboration between more than 26 libraries and archives that seeks to digitally preserve all surviving copies of books printed in the Americas prior to 1601. Building on that collection last year, we concluded another NEH grant which sought to improve OCR technologies for the transcription of early modern and multilingual texts. Uh, the Latin American Digital Initiatives Project preserves and provides digital access to unique archival documents from Latin America with an emphasis on collections documenting human rights issues and underrepresented communities across the region. It is based on a post-custodial archival model in which we provide equipment, training, and capacity building for collections to remain locally on site in their, in their communities of origin, rather than being physically acquired by UT. Beyond all this, we, support, um, we provide support for the integration of digital collections tools and techniques into, into classroom teaching and learning. Um, for instance, in the spring of 2018, we offered a course called Central American History Through Digital Archives, taught by our own director, Dr. Virginia Garrard. This course invites students to explore methodological and theoretical challenges of working with digital collections as both researchers and future teachers, considering not only how to extract information from digital collections, but how it might be used to engage researchers at various stages of their careers, including developing curriculum at the undergraduate level. Um, Beyond all this, we are deeply engaged in areas from linked data to web archiving to transcription, digital preservation, digitization, metadata, digital repository infrastructure, post-custodial archiving, digital scholarship, and digital pedagogy. Our, our team <laughs> encompasses quite a range of expertise. Um, and um, yeah, with that, I'll stop there. There's plenty of time for Q&A at the end and hand it off to the next speaker. I like to have both my hands, you know, animation and gestures. Um, so uh, first, I wanted to thank uh, the libraries. I think you all offer us, as faculty members and researchers, uh, a substantial asset 
as we move forward in whatever we do. And thanks, Unmil, for asking me to be on the panel. Uh, I should say um, I've been privileged to be on many panels, but I was wondering, how did I get on this? Um, I thought it may be because uh, I do a lot of data-intensive research, both qualitative and quantitative. I collect data through surveys, through focus groups, through Delphi methods, uh, just a smorgasbord of different types of techniques, but I also analyze that data quite substantially. Um, and storing that data, accessing that data, all of those uh, do come into play in uh, a lot of my research. So I thought it could be because of my data intensive research. Um, then I thought maybe it's because uh, I do a lot of interdisciplinary research. Uh, my primary area of research is uh, consumer choice, more generally human behavior. Um, uh, and that permeates into, in terms of application, the travel. How do people travel? How do they use their time? Um, and how the usage of time can impact uh, societal issues such as social exclusion. Is there equity in the provision of transportation? Um, very recently, uh, I completed uh, a research study that just got accepted um, with graduate students and my daughter who um, uh, just completed her bachelor's in human development and family sciences. Uh, and I'm just saying that because of the connection. Uh, the paper was about um, how do behaviors during childhood permeate into adulthood travel behavior. So if a person uses transit, public transportation as a child, and if their parents fostered usage of public transportation, does that somehow uh, permeate and manifest itself in how the child, after she or he becomes an adult, uses public transportation? And so uh, my daughter was very interested in this uh, because this part of her work in human development and family sciences. So uh, a lot of interdisciplinary research. So I thought, so first I thought it was perhaps because of my data intensive research. Then I thought maybe it was because of my interdisciplinary research. And I was just walking in over here, and of course I saw my very good friend, Maria, you know, in her very usual animated state, discussing something with Marsha, and then she looked up and said, you know why you're here? Because I asked that you be on the panel. So power to Maria. <laughs> um, kidding aside, uh, I think we are in a very good place, generally speaking, relative to when I did my PhD. Uh, now, that is true across the board in terms of access of data. Uh, I do recall how thrilled I was when um, we got a computer uh, that was able to hold, if I recall correctly, four megabytes of data. Uh, and we were like competing for that machine. Uh, I was doing my PhD at Northwestern, and this machine was in the basement. We used to call it our den. And there used to be this, okay, appointments to use that computer. And so obviously we have come a long way uh, in terms of uh, accessing data. Uh, but I think at the same time, uh, our patience also starts to wear thin. Our expectations change. Um, and one thing that I have noticed is that over time, I find myself click, 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 and the clicks keep adding up and consume my time. And I think to myself, gosh, if I were able to access things right off and avoided all the clicks to get to what I wanted, I would be much, much more efficient. This has been something on my mind, especially in the past six months, because I do find myself spending quite a bit of time, way more than what I think I should be, to be able to reach a particular uh, page. Now, it's not that that page is not easily accessible, but it still takes multiple clicks. So uh, I, I'm an end user. I do not know all the different uh, back end kinds of things that go into um, uh, all of these things, but. That's one thing I think that would be helpful uh, as we move forward. 
com compilation of data and codes, if that is something that can be done across the university, especially as we move into this interdisciplinary frame of operation, I think that would be uh, wonderful. Um, the last thing I would say is visualization. I know Maria works quite a bit on with TAC and visualization. Uh, in many fields, visualization is becoming super key, uh, especially as we try to articulate to the public and to society what we do. Uh, so that's something that uh, does come to mind immediately. There are some other things too, but as an end user, uh, these are the things that immediately sprung up. So let me stop here because Unmil told me my time is up and I look forward to the discussions after. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Masha Pradanovic, and I'm in petroleum engineering. But regardless of that part, I'm also here because my research is data intensive, my research is interdisciplinary, and my research involves a lot of visualization. And totally unrelated, because I used a lot of public transport and also my feet as a child, I continue to do so, and I actually commute here by bus. So anyway, that's <laughs> just the unrelated piece of information. So I would like to, as part of um, uh, this introductory part, is to just introduce what, how the data that I produce actually relates to physical uh, samples and how it is actually related to you and why should you care. <laughs> so. One, I'm, I'm going to start with one part of it. It's, so petroleum engineering, we're about energy and extracting energy from the ground. Ground be, being rock and fluid system. But in an everyday experience in environmental engineering, we all know those words in Texas, when it rains, it pours. And when it pours around here, we have flash flooding. Part of the flash flooding uh, reason is why is essentially because of the structure of the subsurface. So I have some props, and I'm gonna pass them around. So I'm gonna start with the fracture. This is a sandstone, but most of the time we're actually uh, having carbonates. So I'm gonna pass these two as first two samples. So this is uh, limestone from um, Texas, actually from Canyon Lake, that is very porous, and you will see these vugs and openings. And this is a fractured sandstone. So those are rocks, and what you see in there are openings that you can actually visibly see. Uh, those are on millimeter scale up to centimeter scale, but they could go up to the cave scale. Right? However, in between those is actual rock matrix. And because that rock matrix is very tight, and here we don't have a lot of topsoil in central Texas, so when it rains, you basically cannot permeate because the structure is so tight, and because you can't permeate, permeate, you go where it's easy, which is the fractures and openings in our creeks, and boom, suddenly we have flash flooding. Basically, the volume of those fractures is not very large, even though they look very big. The volume next to them that is very tight is the large one, but you can't get to it. To understand how that actually happens, you need to figure out, well, what is this microstructure, and how does it A, evolve, and how do fluids flow? In petroleum engineering, we actually go deeper. We go kilometer, two kilometers, three kilometers deeper than that. But we still look at the competition of fluids in these rocks and what happens when they compete. So when you actually zoom into these structures, I'm actually pick up a limestone first. So when you look at this very kind of complex looking rock that is in tube because it was part of an experiment in petroleum engineering, you will actually zoom in and see microstructure like this, almost kind of repeated in that small rock. And this is, mind you, less than a half millimeter on a side. And that is where your energy lives. That is where oil actually is in the reservoir. It's not in some big pool that we're just drilling to get it out. So when I actually use, and I'm going to start passing these around, in a little simpler structure, that sandstone structure is actually this orange one. Again, your, your fluids are moving in between these grains. So I want to extract information from that data. To get to that data, we have to involve a number of different scanners. It could be a CT scanner, just the one that you, when you go to the doctor, you get slices through your body. I hope you didn't go to the doctor and need <laughs> that, but it's essentially it is the same type of scanner. 
And also, so those are relatively mild ones. We also involve much stronger ones that would kill a person. But to actually get this microstructure uh, of the rock on micron scale, which think your hair, that you need much larger energies. And basically, the smaller you go, the larger your data set that you're getting out of it. So suddenly, your data set has grown from 4 megabytes or 8 megabytes or 80 megabytes, something that you can email to 4 gigabytes, 8 gigabytes. And up to these days, this very fancy microscopes can output a single data set of 250 gigabytes. Okay? So the smaller the scale, the larger. <laughs> it's inverse proportion. We need information based on that. And I'm sure that if you pay any attention to news, you've heard about shale. That's this piece of rock here. It is very dark, very tight. There is no porous structure in sight because this porous structure is 1,000 times smaller than any of the ones that I sent out. So to actually image that, those are these 250 gigabyte large data sets. So essentially, we have to go deeper and get that information. Data sets that we get are these volumetric stacks of data, and they can be very large. And I can't do almost anything unless I can visualize it. And these days, I can't visualize it necessarily by just propping it up on my computer. I actually need the help of a supercomputer to do that. So basically, there is a lot of data sets like this. Any kind of volumetric type of images, or even large, very large aerial structures. And Google Earth comes to mind. <laughs> As you zoom in, you get uh, all of these visualized structures. We need to weigh to A, visualize, relate these data sets and get information out of them, actually summarize them in some way, manipulate them in some way. So basically the front end of the, what libraries um, have to provide is essentially a way to easily engage and inter interact with these data sets, which is not easy, as I mentioned. I mentioned supercomputers, didn't I? <laughs> so, so there is like, and there is this, I have to somehow communicate to that supercomputer, which is somewhere in the den, somewhere <laughs> in Texas Advanced Computing Center. So I need web portals. And basically, I am here because I design, uh, with, initially, I had no idea what I actually need until I, we keep mentioning Maria, Maria Esteva is sitting over there <laughs> until I bumped into her. So once upon a time I proposed, oh yes, I'm going to do a portal of these images that is going to solve all of my problems. And in my NSF career grant I proposed $10,000 to build it. That was very naive. Uh, almost $700,000 later, we actually do have, in another proposal, of course, we do have a portal that is attempting to visualize these images and basically try to get to this interaction part with the data. So, thank you. Um, so, uh, I'm Eric Meyer. I'm the Dean of the School of Information. I've only been here less than a year at University of Texas. Most of my career was spent at the University of Oxford. Um, and I've got a strong connection to libraries. So I've worked a lot with the British Library in my career. I've, I was a curator, which is a very posh sounding title at the Bodleian Library. Basically, it means I was on their management board. But I've been thinking a lot about um, how libraries function and what, what libraries do in the digital age. Most of my scholarship, if you go and look at my, my publications have been about digital scholarship and the changing nature of digital scholarship. So what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about some big picture things I've observed over the last 15 years or so, because I think it contributes to today's discussion. Um, this question of what does digital scholarship look like that we're grappling with as part of this, this remit of this committee, as I understand it, is uh, trying to figure out where is the leading edge. As Shandra suggested in his remarks, the leading edge keeps changing of what constitutes digital scholarship. So thinking back through some of my research that you could read about, I, I pre prevented myself from bringing slides because I could go on for hours if I brought slides and showed you all these research projects. But 10 to 15 years ago, there was this wave of digitization going on. There was money sloshing about everywhere to digitize stuff, to take physical stuff and make digital copies and stick them online and hope that somebody used them. Uh, this is when the Google Books project was started. Uh, some of you might remember the Google Newspapers project. Anybody remember that? Didn't go, very, go, go anywhere. They, at the time, they promised to digitize all the newspapers in the world. Um, didn't work out. Um, 
but there was this wave of digitization and also the growth of born digital materials. We saw more things being born digital on the internet elsewhere. And people who were paying for this had spent a lot of money paying for digitization and they wondered, is this money well spent? I did a project with a British organization called JISC uh, back in 2008-9 or so that was to look at the impacts of these digital collections. Is anybody using them? And one of the most interesting things we found uh, of the many findings was that by getting collections managers to think about uses and look at the data that was being collected about who was using their digital resources, they often discovered entirely unexpected uses, things that they wouldn't have been able to anticipate, they wouldn't have been able to design for, but users were finding and making use of these things in new and interesting ways that they couldn't have designed for. And so then getting them to think about, well, how can we make sure that our platforms are generative so that it enables these new kinds of uses, that it enables things that were not necessarily built in, but also we haven't designed things to prevent uses, sort of off-label uses. Um, at the time, 10 or 15 years ago, we're starting to see a, an increasingly complex knowledge ecosystem. If you think about what publication used to be like, we'd read a few articles, we'd go off and do some research, we'd write our article, we'd publish it, and then other people would read that and the cycle just repeats over and over and over again. Um, we started to see 10 years ago an increasingly cl complex ecosystem, more born digital journals, more open access journals. We started to see much more uh, electronic publishing. As we heard earlier, Texas Scholar Works started about 10 years ago. Um, at the same time as IU Scholar Works and a number of other these digital repositories started. Now, along with this, one of the most important trends was the growing disintermediation of knowledge. So intermediation, you can work out what that means. It means somebody's in between you and the knowledge. And about 10 years ago, we started to see knowledge becoming disintermediated. People anywhere can go into Google and they can find stuff. Whether they can understand it or not, that's a whole different question, but they can get access to it. And that challenge of being uh, in a library world where libraries were intermediaries historically in a now disintermediated environment is a huge challenge that libraries everywhere are dealing with. So, we started to see these questions about disintermediation now are playing up uh, in everything we read about trust online, whether we trust the information we see, whether uh, fake information and fake news and other sorts of things are, are uh, weakening our ability to trust each other and trust the information we find, but it's part of this disintermediation. Um, five to ten years ago, all the attention in this world of dig digital scholarship started to look at, well, now that we know that people are using digital materials, how are they using them? Again, I could refer you to a number of my studies with an organization called the Research Information Network that looked at information practices in the humanities, the social sciences, the sciences. And I'll share with you just one or two little facts from that. When we looked at humanities scholars at the time, remember this is seven, eight years ago now, um, two thirds used libraries as one of their first points of references when researching a new topic with which they were unfamiliar. If they didn't know something about it and they wanted to find something new, they would use libraries as one of their first points of contact. Physical scientists, less than 10% would use libraries as their first point of contact. And actually many of the physical scientists we um, interviewed, physicists and so forth, said, I don't use libraries, I haven't used libraries in 10 or 15 or 20 years. We said, well, okay, well, what do you do? And they would walk us through what they did and they said, I'd read these journals and so forth. And we said, do you read them online? Oh, of course I read them online. How do you get access to that? I don't know, they just magically appear on my screen. Um, <laughs> One of the things that we noted at the time was that libraries already then were getting too good at making themselves invisible. So they were providing services invisibly to their users, which is great. You can just click on things and it's provided through the subscriptions to your libraries. But it also means libraries struggle to sell the message of how important they are when they've become invisible to everybody. Now, good infrastructure is invisible. That's the point of infrastructure. We only notice it when it breaks. How many of you, before I say this sentence, paid attention to the fact that the lights are on? You haven't, right? If they all went off, we would immediately notice that the lights were off. They're part of the infrastructure. If the, when, when physical scientists at the time, certainly and still today, notice when they don't have access to their journal articles is when they're not on campus and they try and click on something and it says, yeah, sorry, you gotta pay for this article. But it was free when I was at my desk. So this um, role of memory institutions in providing access often goes unremarked. Also in that same, in those same sets of studies, one of the most common ways that people found out about new information about topics that they didn't, weren't already familiar with was to consult peers and experts. 80% plus humanities, scientists, social scientists all said they went and asked people that they knew and trusted if they wanted to find out something new. And that might be their peers and their colleagues, it might be people in organizations like libraries, but it is somebody going and talking to them. And this equaled the number of people who use Google as their starting point. Um, disciplines matter. And this was on one of your slides about the importance of disciplines. 
Some disciplines have very diverse information needs. Uh, I did a lot of work with a uh, resource called Early English Books Online, EBO. And one of the things we did with EBO was we uh, interviewed a lot of and did surveys with a lot of EBO re users. And we asked EBO users who said EBO is one of the most important uses of their, one of the most important resources in their research, what other resources do they use? Um, there are 136 other resources identified by about 250 users that they also considered absolutely crucial for their work. So if you're an organization providing access to EBO, it's not enough to provide EBO. You've also got to provide these other resources. And it wasn't that all of them used the whole 136. I don't think there was any other resource that had more than 10 individual users. But as part of the EBO ecosystem, they rely on this huge range of other resources to do their work. Some disciplines are very constrained. Uh, one of my research assistants did an interview with a nuclear physicist that um, I read afterwards and she, she told me about afterwards, who said, there's 50 people in the world who do what I do. We publish in five journals. There's no such thing as information overload. I know everything that's happening. <laughs> I know them all. I read everything they write. It's simple. Uh, so we can't just assume that everybody's experiencing information overload in the same way. Different disciplines have different realities. Now, also recently, we have done some work on the changing nature of scholarly work and resources. What constitutes a scholarly resource? So I did some work with ProQuest that uh, was um, out last year that looked at newspapers and the scholarly impact of newspapers. And we tend to think, oh, you know, are newspapers really that important in research? Um, it turns out that it's actually, there is a lot of use of newspapers. So 13 to 14,000 academic publications a year cite the New York Times. That's a dramatic change from 2000 and, uh, 1996 when it was about 2,000 publications a year. So it's gone up uh, over seven, eight times. Um, about 6% of all social science publications in Scopus between 2000 and 2017 cited one of the four newspapers that we studied. It's a huge use of newspapers. Newspapers are not generally considered important scholarly resources when we think about the range of scholarly resources, but it's an important part of the publication world and it's what a range of scholars are using. So to wrap up, I just want to think about some of the opportunities that memory institutions face. We're in an age where we can start to ask what do the information and memory institutions of the future look like? How do we change the ways we protect and preserve and our collective memories and our assembled knowledge? We can't rely just on Google to do everything for us. Um, that's, uh, that road is folly if we try to rely on that. Google doesn't have long-term interests of maintaining these things. They do a pretty good job at providing access to stuff, but they also have a long history of just shutting things off when they go, grow bored with them as an, as an organization. What are the role of libraries in a largely disintermediated future when we don't have to rely on libraries as the point of access to find things? What is the role of information in providing access, providing knowledge, providing expertise? Um, also, we have to grapple with issues like open access and open access publications and open data. What is the role of organizations like libraries that are long served, long lived um, institutions to provide access to data that's not useful just today, but is gonna be useful in 100 years and 200 years and so on down the road. And also this question of how do libraries as spaces, not the agreement of this committee, but part of the overall task force, what role do they play in our active scholarly life? I think these are all interesting questions. It's something I'm very interested in in my own work and my own research, but it's also one of the key things that we address at the School of Information. And I think it's something that the University of Texas is now, by grappling with these issues, having an opportunity to really emerge as a leader in this space, particularly in the US. Thanks. I think at this point we are going to open the uh, discussion and hear from our audience. Uh, unfortunately, people who are watching online have to just listen to you guys. So the room is yours. Please, please come by and tell us what you think. If you don't, I have more stuff to talk about. statement. My name is Greg Lipscomb. I'm with the uh, advisory committee to the libraries. Um, it's a bit of a throwback, but it's a challenge to uh, digitization to uh, understand this and respond to it. It's by Paul Woodruff, who's a noted scholar on campus, uh, was head of plan to philosophy, the first uh, undergraduate studies dean. And he, uh, I asked him about his writing method, and here it is. Uh, for my field, 
Books in a library are a necessity, not a luxury. Many classic books are not available in the e-versions, and when they are, the e-format does not work well for scholarship. I need to have about eight books open in front of me to work on a text. Even big screens do not handle that many. Also, I need to leave through them often. Scrolling is time consuming and does not handle uh, that very well. Um, so he says he's tried for superficial research. E-library e may be okay, but not for the real thing in my field of classics. So um, he's of my generation, the Vietnam vet generation. Uh, I don't know how a young classic scholar approaches it, it perhaps differently. But I think whatever the, the task force comes up with, it has to be a system that accommodates this kind of intensive, tactile approach as, long as, as well as digitization. Thanks. Can I share something in, re in re relation to that? So um, I think a very important point, and one of the things that we have to remember is that there are always going to be different modes of scholarship and that we've got to enable different modes. So we, we have to not privilege one over the other. So that model, um, which has been prevalent for hundreds of years, uh, we can support that without then diminishing other kinds. I remember doing an interview once with a historian who did mostly digital work, uh, not because he didn't like that kind of work, but because all his work was available digitally, he was able to be most effective and most efficient digitally. And he said, you know, sometimes I feel like I have to sort of hide the fact that I do everything digitally because when I look at top scholars from 25 years ago, they spent all their time getting dusty in libraries and sitting in archives, and I aspire to be a top scholar, and I'm afraid that they won't take me seriously if I don't look like I've done the real work of getting dusty in archives. So it goes both ways, right? We don't want to uh, say that, well, this is the, the best way of doing things. It might be best for some modes and some types of scholars and some kinds of questions, and other ones might be better for other kinds. We don't want to get to a situation, though, where we feel like people have to hide whatever their methods are under a barrel, that if someone wants to be surrounded by books, that should be great, but if someone else wants to have everything digitally, that should be great as well. I, again, an another very short anecdote. I remember doing a project that we were interviewing some students at Royal Holloway in London, and they were second year, master, uh, second year undergraduate students studying history. And we asked them about when they cited digital resource, when they cited, well first we asked them how they found stuff and they said digitally through the library. You know, that's how they found information. We said, well when you cite it in your papers, do you ever indicate that it was accessed digitally? You know, do you include a URL or anything else? They said, well, you know, when I first make my bibliography, it has a bunch of them in there because I copy and paste things in or I use my, my management tools and they put them in. And then I look at it, and if it seems like there's too many of them, I just start deleting a bunch of URLs so my professors don't think I was, I was lazy and didn't do real work. You know, so, so that, that stigma that was still attached to that is something that I don't think is, is beneficial because uh, there's lots of different ways of, of discovering knowledge that are, benef that are valuable and completely uh, the, the best practice for the kinds of people who are doing them. And I will address this from the physical sciences or engineering. The two types of data are complementary. Uh, there is physical work, experimental work, experimental measurements that you're going to perform in the lab, and there's nothing replacing being in the lab and actually seeing that and executing it and questioning. But then whatever it is that you either, I was talking about images, but whatever you record with higher and higher resolution is complementary to that and you need some sort of uh, infrastructure that will in enable inspection in both so that you can walk the both ways. But there is never, though often in, in digital world, in, in, in my sense, there was at the very beginning, there was this, uh, there's this, oh yes, we're gonna image that and then we're not gonna need anything physical anymore, you're just gonna click the button. No, <laughs> in terms of, the way science developed, there is experimental work, uh, there's theoretical work, there's simulation work. Those are all different legs of <laughs> inspection and uh, how do you actually uh, derive knowledge and information. So. Yeah, I, I, I think there's clearly also a generational issue of how people absorb things. Um, I personally uh, have to print 
things. When I'm revising my papers, I need a hard copy. And my uh, advice to my graduate students is, before you give anything externally, print it out at least three times and iterate. And then you have reached somewhere. So I think there might be some generational issues. But I should also say that um, I certainly do not go to the libraries as I used to when I was doing my PhD. Uh, everything is accessible you know, uh, on the web. I just go and get my articles. And I think that in terms of scholarship, uh, one thing that in my field at least is very important is I want it now. I want that information now. I'm trying to position my research in the bigger picture, and I can't wait until tomorrow. I just am in that zone, I'm writing, and I need that information now. And that's when I find um, that, uh, for example, UT Access, I, re I go there very often to get journals. Um, the one place where I was talking about click, 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 I find uh, a little frustrating sometimes is um, I go somewhere and it says, hey, uh, do you want to find it in U at UT? And I click on it and it just doesn't take me anywhere. Uh, I don't know why that is so, but uh, certainly I think that's a generational issue there, but point well taken. I think both of them can coexist. I mean, I, I would take a little bit of issue with the generational argument because um, certainly the data we've had, it's not as clear cut as that. I mean, I'm probably older than you. Um, everything in my life is digital. I can't remember the last time I printed anything out. Um, I, I don't print, and I don't, I've got some books on my shelf, but I largely deal with digital materials. And I've got younger colleagues who love having things printed out and take notes on paper and so forth. So it's, it's not as simple as generational. I think, it, again, it's about modes of research, about modes of using things. I wanted to um, uh, underscore something that Masha said about learning the physical and the digital. So an uh, article I published a few years back about um, a resource called Digital Image Archive of Medieval Music. One of the observations we made in that article, my research assistant was observing a teacher who was teaching a student how to use this digital image archive of medieval music. And one of the things that we, we noted in the article was that part of the skill she was teaching the student was how to read what's on the screen because she'd seen the physical artifacts, they never had, and there was like this, this one part that was a white mark on the screen. And she, having seen the physical artifacts, knew that that was a binder's knife that had been used to uh, take this uh, manuscript and put it into a binding document. And so this cut, this was a cut in the material. It wasn't immediately evident looking at the screen. So she was helping the student learn how to reconstruct what they were seeing on the digital screen by mapping that to her knowledge of the physical space. And then this person, if they became a, a professional, would eventually have those skills but also see some of the physical objects themselves. And so this mapping between the digital and the physical is a learned skill. It's not something that comes naturally. And I think that's something that organizations can think about. How do we help um, aspiring scholars and students learn those skills of being able to map between the physical and the digital? I wasn't kidding. So uh, you, you've all presented about your research. And I think what happens in research is there is a core intellectual activity that the publication focuses on. And then there are a lot of supporting activities that go into making the intellectual work happen. Could you, from your experience and, and your frustration at the time that you were doing these activities, thinking back on that, talk a little bit about which of these activities, whether intellectual or whether the support activities, uh, you would like to offload in a way to either your department, to the libraries, or, or to something else so that you can focus on the things that you think bring most value to your work. So, I mean, one very concrete thing that I think libraries are, have been getting better at, and you mentioned I, I, uh, uh, UT Scholar Works, um, in Europe, uh, Academics are much better at making their materials available via open access, partly because of changing laws and changing funding regulations. It's not true much in the United States yet. So I think libraries can become a much more active player in making it easy for faculty members to share their preprints or their other open access versions of their articles because we don't want to have to track down all the different versions. We don't want to keep track of everything that we've 
done if we've got a, a change version. We don't want to have to fill out. I remember one early version of one of these um, repositories that I won't mention by name um, expected me to fill out about 10 pages of metadata to put, it, put in my article and deposit. That meant that nobody used it. You know, so I think libraries can become very good active proponents and advocates for um, open access. One of the things that uh, we did back at Oxford was we uh, established this act on acceptance uh, campaign that said, you know, once your paper is accepted, deposit it in the repository right then. Uh, there are a lot of other carrots and sticks going on there, but that message of it's been accepted, put it in the repository. It's a very simple thing to remember, and it com becomes part of your work process if you think, think that way, and it's a natural role for libraries to play. Um, I have also been surprised at um, how much you actually have to make things to be easy to use in order to actually motivate uh, people depositing their data and making it available for others. And uh, in science and engineering, we tend, or any kind of really uh, effort, we, we tend to live in our little worlds <laughs> and we think about our data. And it's library's role should be kind of trying to integrate that and finding con common denominators, data models that work for majority in order to actually make uh, collecting metadata or basically information about the data, information about the process. All of the images that I described, they're garbage unless you know what is the physical size of the rock that you imaged. What are the fluids that you injected? What are the, so all of the types of processes and experimental uh, procedures that actually go into that work and making it sort of easy to collect that type of data. And um, these days we all like click, click, click online. So basically uh, libraries have to have these portals that are kind of collecting data through, uh, or web portals that are making that, that process easier in order to present data online. So some sort of intermediate intermediate translation stage <laughs> for all of the um, data that goes in. I, I think uh, related to what uh, Eric and Marsha were talking about, um, it seems to me that as we move into this very, very interdisciplinary uh, uh, landscape, so to say, um, it might be cliche, but that is the truth, with boundaries fading so fast, uh, I think it would be wonderful if to be able to share data that a person from one particular program collects uh, so that it's available, if not immediately as data to be used, at least in the context of a data dictionary, in the context of documentation of what kind of data is available. Um, I mean, I'm so interested in a lot of uh, the data that my daughter says is available in the human development and family sciences, uh, and I would love to have access to that right now. Um, if not the data, at least what is available in that data, so that it certainly engenders for me what kinds of analyses can be done that is relevant to what I'm doing. So I think in this interdisciplinary landscape, some kind of an integration, if not of the actual data of what all of us are doing, and it, and it could be, you know, uh, even UT oriented, so you need to be a UT researcher or faculty to make that happen so that it promotes us as one interdisciplinary unit. <laughs> so um, I'm going to reframe the question maybe a little bit. Uh, being part of the libraries, I'm more in, maybe more interested in discussing what we can, we can offer as a library than what we're offloading <laughs> to ourselves. But um, I mean, I think all of my co-panelists have hit on key areas where the libraries is really interested and invested. I would add to that, um, you know, preservation and preservation planning from the start of projects so that um, you plan for the full life cycle and that it can be reused and you can find your information. And that can be consultation on file naming, description and metadata so you, can, you can't use the, the pictures if there's nothing, no information associated with it, you can't find them again and um, recommendations on file formats that um, are gonna stand the test of time and not be lost when there's no longer WordPerfect or other outdated platforms. Um, I think we have a, a huge role that we can play in consulting on those areas 
The access question, I think, is really critical. And this, again, preservation and access are things that libraries have been doing and doing well for a very long time. We, there are different tools and technologies and infrastructure needed to do them in a digital world, but they're things we've been thinking about for a long time. I think for us to particularly, uh, another area that we've touched on that maybe not ex explicitly, um, is the question of information ethics. And that does come into the question of copyright issues, it comes into the questions around privacy and personal information. Again, these are things we think about all the time and we're really happy to engage with scholars on and to help think through. Um, yeah. I think we're out of time at this point, but, but I think there are other ways that you can engage with us. So I, I want to make a pitch for that again. Thanks. Um, Besides, you know where to find me. Um, so uh, I want you guys to think about this question as well. What is it in your work that you don't want to do and instead you would just hand it off to the libraries, right? We have to start somewhere. No one has a clear idea. So why not just say, this is what I absolutely hate doing. Let's let someone else take care of this. And, and we'll figure out who that someone else is at a later point, right? It may be the libraries, it may not be. But, but just figure out what you absolutely do not want to do and tell us that. Uh, just a quick pitch for the next uh, couple of uh, meetings that we have coming up, April 15th and 29th. And we really do want to hear from you. So, so tell us what you don't want to do. And a thanks to our panelists, as well as to the many, many people who made this meeting happen and put in a lot of time to make sure that you guys have a comfortable space to be in. Thank you so much.